Mount Fuji's monumental yet gracefully sloping form rises from bands of mist and clouds. Its awesome height and sacred identity accentuated by the sun and moon riding low beside it. Pilgrims climb a zigzagging trail toward the Buddhas enshrined on each of Fuji's three peaks. Lotus petals dance in the air above. Around the base of the mountain, horizontal bands of mist conceal and reveal discrete sections, inviting us into selected glimpses of temple halls, inns, purification springs, and rest stops, all alive with pilgrims' activity. This large painting is loaded with information about the area, its religious institutions, local attractions, and activities. It tells a story. The story it tells is the subject of my talk today. This magnificent portrait of Japan's tallest mountain is an early example of a novel genre of painting which modern scholars have named Sankei Mandala, or pilgrimage mandalas. By the late 16th century, pilgrimage mandalas would become large-scale, boldly colored paintings that depict sacred places, the routes leading to them, and the benefits and pleasures awaiting the visitor. They were the visual component in vigorous fundraising campaigns by traveling monks and nuns, with the money destined for the renewal of shrine temple grounds. To inspire generosity among the laity, these monks and nuns perform narrative recitations, using the mandalas to guide their audiences on pilgrimages to sacred sites, earning their viewers both spiritual and worldly benefits. Here is a photograph of a nun performing a recitation before a Nachi shrine pilgrimage mandala. Pilgrimage mandalas flourished in the second half of the 16th century, when after a century of civil war, the military government of the Ashikaga shoguns collapsed, and a new class of urban commoners wielding wealth and power emerged and took over the role of patronage for the upkeep of Japan's shrines and temples. Religious institutions opened their doors to commoners and actively solicited their economic support, spurring a surge in pilgrimage. Sacred spaces that had been accessible only to the aristocracy and to prestigious religious practitioners were now visited in large numbers by wealthy commoners. Pilgrimage mandalas visually reflect these socioeconomic changes by depicting commoners in the role of pilgrim and patron alongside the nobility and military aristocracy in and around shrine temple grounds. And here we see some details illustrating the variety of figures depicted in the Kiyomizudetta pilgrimage mandala. Though their primary purpose was to promote pilgrimage to the repre represented site and inspire donations for its upkeep, pilgrimage mandalas also had the effect of visually documenting their new patrons' rising social status. Pilgrimage mandalas thus provide a window into late medieval Japan, giving visual expression to the social, political, and economic changes that accompanied the empowerment of the commoner classes in the 16th century. Until recently, the genre has been largely overlooked by scholars of art history, both in Japan and in the West. While art historians dismiss them as folk art, scholars from other disciplines, such as history and religion, have found in them rich troves of visual information about sacred sites, religious architecture, and late medieval manners, customs, and pilgrimage practices. In the first part of my talk, I will introduce the genre and show that these paintings, which may appear at first glance to be naive and folksy, do skillfully combine the visual language and compositional features of elite painting traditions in order to appeal to a wide range of tastes and interests. I will argue that pilgrimage mandalas are complex, calibrated representations that operate on multiple levels and serve a range of purposes. They are didactic, devotional, and ideological. They are guide maps to sacred sites, and they are also cosmological maps that chart religious doctrines. In the second part of my talk, I will show that pilgrimage mandalas are, are highly charged images that emphasize particular institutional interests and positions. To illustrate this point, I will compare two examples of Fuji pilgrimage mandalas, and will show that the paintings highlight different religious institutions located at the base of Fuji each reflecting the commissioning institution's assertions and pretensions. The images do not necessarily represent how things were on the ground, but how the patron envisioned things ought to be. The paintings are therefore instrumental as well as expressive tools, created both for fundraising among the newly risen class and to declare institutional authority. I argue that the presence as well as the absence of particular halls or figures provides clues to differences in the patronage and date of production for each of the paintings. My analysis will show that pilgrimage mandalas are not static, formulaic representations as they are commonly perceived, but are rather historically specific paintings that articulate changing institutional interests, 
encoded within a trove of visual information about a time and place in history left murky in the textual record. Before I begin describing the pilgrimage mandala genre, I would like to take a moment to discuss the word mandala. In esoteric Buddhism, a mandala usually indicates a circular or square configuration with a center that radiates outward into compartmentalized areas. The deity at the center of the configuration engages in reciprocal interactions with figures in the outer areas, who each signify aspects of that central deity. A practitioner would visualize and meditate on the mandala's peripheral elements and unite these outer manifestations in the center of the mandala, and then internally absorb the mandala as a whole. Like all Buddhist icons, an esoteric mandala is not so much a representation of the divine as it is the locus of the, of the divine, the ground upon which the principal deity is made manifest. In Japan, from the early 11th century, the term mandala was expanded to include not only schematic esoteric mandalas, but paintings of religious landscapes as well. These included representations of the Pure Land paradises of Buddhist deities and depictions of shrine temple complexes. The theological rationale underlying the expanded application of the term mandala was that in the kami worshiping tradition, or Shinto, the divine is embedded in the landscape. So a representation of that landscape, just like a representation of a Buddha, was itself the actual reality of the divine. So even though the term pilgrimage mandala is a 20th century designation, the paintings were likely conceived under this broad concept of mandala. Um, pilgrimage mandalas are schematic visual guides to sacred sites and their environs. They describe the gates and buildings that demarcate sacred and secular spaces and illustrate the spiritual benefits of visiting the represented site and the assortment of pleasures to be experienced in the surrounding area. Here I am showing details from three different pilgrimage mandalas, illustrating the variety of experiences to be had. Within the sacred space, one might find the performance of contemporary rituals, a glimpse of the temple's icon, scenes from the origin history of the site, or merrymakers enjoying the beautiful scenery. Outside of the sacred area, one may find picnickers and sightseers, anecdotal scenes from the area's folklore, local specialties being sold in stalls, brothels, inns, or native deities flying through the air. These paintings are a tour de force of visual information, a catalog of material and visual culture produced at a time of expanding commoner consumption of religious practice. The detailed and exhaustive illustration of such a small area indicates that the temples were determined to tempt every kind of visitor. There is something for everyone in these pictures. While the origin history served a legitimizing function, providing the temple with a long and distinguished religious history, the contemporary rituals advertise the spiritual rewards waiting to be attained at that site, and the earth earthly pleasures appear, appealed directly to the senses. Pilgrimage mandalas share many common features. They are large scale paintings measuring about a meter and a half squared, usually executed on mulberry paper using low quality mineral pigments. The background is often painted with a deep ochre color, believed to be a substitute for the gold leaf ground used in elite studio paintings. Seasonal blossoms punctuate the image, enhancing the beauty and allure of the site. The images are filled with figures exploring the shrine or temple complex and its surroundings. And a monk or nun is usually stationed in a fundraising hut collecting donations. Pilgrimage mandalas also share a common compositional framework, the components of which I will outline in blue. They are typically foregrounded by a body of water and crowned by distant mountains. The sun and moon float on clouds in the upper area of the paintings. And nestled between mountain and sea is a shrine or temple complex, the pilgrimage road leading to it, and, a town outside the, and the town outside the sacred gates, all viewed from an elevated perspective. This compositional structure appears to represent a sacred universe, a schematic, timeless, and complete other world, suffusing the pilgrimage mandala with cosmological overtones. This spatial configuration typically does not reflect the actual topography of the represented area, but it creates an overall image of sanctity and of a numinous cosmology beyond the realm of the viewer. It also largely follows the compositional organization of shrine mandalas, a genre of painting I will discuss in more detail in a moment. The compositional effect of depicting a body of water in the foreground is to create a barrier that must be crossed. The water symbolizes a demarcation between the sacred site and the secular world from which the viewer pilgrim has come. 
Crossing the water via bridge or boat signifies a passage and a cleansing and renewal. One leaves behind the present world and its worries, much as one would when on an actual pilgrimage journey, and enters into another realm, both into the realm of the painting and into the realm of the spiritual. This way of framing the pilgrimage mandalas was a compositional choice that heightened the symbolic meaning and transformative effect of crossing over a body of water at the start of one's virtual pilgrimage. The canopy of mountains in the background further heightens the sacred impression of the landscape. One can usually identify the mountains illustrated in pilgrimage mandalas, but the artists often had to bend reality to make them conform to artistic convention. The three mountains illustrated at the top of the Kyomizudera pilgrimage mandala, for example, have been identified from left to right as Mount Gyosen, Kyomizu Mountain, and Amida Mountain. From the perspective we are given in the painting, looking down from above, from south to north, the three mountains should be lined up vertically, not horizontally. Positioning the mountains in this way, however, suggests a Buddhist triad, thus enhancing the sacred appearance of the mandala. At the same time, pilgrimage mandalas could also function as a guide map. As the primary purpose of the genre was to advertise the represented site and to attract pilgrims and donations, the mandala had to present the viewer with a relatively clear impression of the landscape in case the viewer was inspired to make an actual pilgrimage to the site. A number of scholars have observed that the layout of the sacred grounds and pilgrimage mandalas is portrayed in great detail to ensure the image could effectively function as a guide map to the shrine temple complex. The paintings are also instructive. The viewer follows the pilgrims through the mandala as they pray before different halls and participate in rituals and ceremonies, learning from them the appropriate etiquette for visiting the site. On a related note, pilgrimage mandalas are believed to have also provided a conduit for a virtual trip for those who wished to accrue the karmic benefits of pilgrimage but were unable to travel. Pilgrims in the painting could therefore also serve as a visual proxy for the viewer on his or her virtual tour through the painting. While the sacred territory is given a great amount of space and detail, the pilgrimage road leading to the site is usually compressed and distorted, its shape altered to fit the confined space of the painting. The pilgrimage process of walking was an essential component of medieval Japanese pilgrimage. Viewers would have been familiar with this part of the pilgrimage experience. Elongating the road also gives the artist more space to paint local sites, scenery, and commercial activity. Illustrated along the pilgrimage road and in the town outside the sacred gate are the local shops selling delicacies and specialties of the area, which could only be enjoyed in that particular locale. For example, the tea made from the healing water of Kiyomizudera's Ottawa Falls, or the combs made in the town of Okamoto near the Issei Shrines. Pilgrimage mandalas are thus infused with a local flavor and energy that captures the life of the area, enticing the viewer to undertake an actual pilgrimage to the site and enjoy its unique delights. The artistic language of pilgrimage mandalas derives from a combination of earlier painting traditions. The composition largely follows the organizational principles of Miya mandala, or shrine mandalas, a genre of religious painting illustrating aerial views of sacred grounds. While the rich and varied representation of figures and architectural elements may be located in Nakachu Dakigaizu, or screen paintings of Kyoto, produced for the military aristocracy. By relying on a shared iconography and artistic language, pilgrimage mandalas refer to other paintings, connecting with and building upon a larger network of visual imagery. As a result, these paintings would have appeared both familiar and original to contemporary audiences. The Fuji pilgrimage mandala illustrates this point. Typically referred to as a transitional painting and a nascent form of the genre, it is arguably the earliest and most skillfully painted extant pilgrimage mandala. Unlike the majority of pilgrimage mandalas, it is painted on silk with high quality mineral pigments and bears the seal of the leading artist of the day, Kano Motonobu. If we compare it with the Kasuga Shrine Mandala, for example, we notice that the same high quality materials are used and that it employs a similar compositional structure. The Shrine Temple precincts are viewed from an elevated perspective with a route leading the viewer up into the painted space and with a canopy of mountains in the background. Shrine Mandalas often illustrate the resident deities of the site at the top of the painting. An inclusion we also find in the Fuji Pilgrimage Mandala and one that typically is not included in the pilgrimage mandala genre. 
The compositional movement of the shrine mandalas generally flows along a vertical axis from bottom to top in a fixed direction. In a pilgrimage mandala, viewer pilgrims also enter the painting from the bottom, but they are then led in different directions. The route moves left and right, up and down, and then circles around. However, in the Fuji pilgrimage mandala, the vertical movement of shrine mandalas is more or less preserved, perhaps because the site illustrated is dominated by a sacred mountain, and the ultimate goal is to reach its peak. What most distinguishes pilgrimage mandalas from these earlier paintings of temples and shrines is the inclusion of commoner pilgrims exploring the grounds. The Fuji pilgrimage mandala is no exception. Pilgrims figure prominently throughout the painting. The figures in pilgrimage mandalas are believed to have been drawn from screen paintings of Kyoto. These large folding screens depict panoramic seasonal views of Kyoto, illustrating in great detail the numerous daily activities of the city's residents. Commoners farm their fields, buy and sell goods at the market, and peddle their wares on the street. Their workaday life is juxtaposed with scenes of dancing and drinking sake under blossoming cherry trees. Alongside this commoner activity, warriors amble through the streets, aristocrats conduct their ancient ceremonies in the imperial palace, and clergy perform rituals in shrines and temples. Pilgrimage mandalas present a similarly detailed view of Japan's sacred sites and their surroundings, with figures of all classes engaged in a variety of religious and local activities. The similarity in the way of depicting the various figures suggests the artist of pilgrimage mandalas in screen paintings of Kyoto were trained in the same workshops. One scholar has even proposed that the pattern representation of figures indicates that many of these works were produced in the same studios, the figural types freely used and exchanged. An alternative explanation is that pilgrimage mandala artists were deliberately drawing their figures from a shared visual store that would have been immediately familiar to the viewer. This familiarity may have aided in the virtual journey through the painting by allowing the viewer to quickly identify and project into the figure they most closely connected with. Despite the many similarities between shrine mandalas, screen paintings of Kyoto, and pilgrimage mandalas, the period of production, the use, and the class towards which these genres was directed were very different. Shrine mandalas were produced from the 13th to 16th century, while screen paintings of Kyoto were produced from the early 16th century. Pilgrimage mandalas first appeared in the mid 16th century and disappeared about a century later. Shrine mandalas catered to the beliefs of the aristocracy and were commissioned for the purpose of being worshipped as a principal image by temples and shrines, and later by groups and individuals associated with the court. Screen paintings of Kyoto were painted for members of the military elite and have been interpreted as idealized views of the territory under government control. Pilgrimage mandalas, by contrast, were produced for temples and shrines to attract visitors, primarily urban commoners, and were intended to be viewed widely. As such, the material quality of pilgrimage mandalas is lower than both shrine mandalas and screen paintings of Kyoto. There is no written evidence that describes how pilgrimage mandalas were used. However, the material evidence, such as a grid-like trace of lines indicating that the paintings were folded, and loops that remain along the top of some examples for hanging the painting using a wood rod, has led scholars to conclude that the painting served as the visual component in narrative recitation performances. There is also a long historical precedent for monastics performing oral recitations before paintings. Moreover, a number of pilgrimage mandalas have been found stored together with a Kumano Ten Worlds mandala, a painting we know for certain was used for narrative recitations. Pilgrimage mandalas are thought to have been carried in miniature shrines or wooden backpacks by itinerant monks and nuns to towns and festivals and used to help vividly describe the worldly and soteriological benefits of donating and traveling to the site. Unlike traditional narrative painting on hand scrolls, where a story unfolds chronologically in a linear direction, often with accompanying text, pilgrimage mandalas have no singular narrative. Instead, they have multiple narratives and temporal layers that the performer may pick up and tailor to the audience, allowing them to make any individual listener the hero of his or her own pilgrimage story. Fusing together image and narrative, the performer would stand before an audience and point out the wonders to be experienced along the pilgrimage road and on the site's sacred grounds. No script survives of a pilgrimage mandala recitation from the late medieval period. This suggests that performances were improvised, that the paintings were narrative instruments to a performance that was adapted to suit the composition of the audience. For example, if there were many young people in the audience for a Kiyomizu Deda pilgrimage mandala recitation, 
the narrator might tailor the virtual tour to emphasize the matchmaking prowess of Kiyomizu's deity. If there were more merchants in the crowd, the narrator might highlight the local crafts and specialties of the area. This is another explanation for why pilgrimage mandalas include such a rich variety of details and layers. These provide the performer with an assortment of narrative threads that could be drawn out in various ways. A scene from the Sumiyoshi Festival screen, a contemporaneous painting of daily life, gives a sense of what the interaction between performer, painting, and viewer might have looked like. In the lower right corner of the screen, we find a nun stationed at the foot of a bridge, explaining the meaning of the Kumano Ten Worlds mandala to a group of women and children who have gathered around her. Pilgrimage mandalas were similarly employed in informal, impromptu performances and were conceived to be engaged in this way. They were not intended to be hung in temples nor kept hidden from view. They were displayed outside for all to see. For this reason, we may presume that the number of mandalas that survive today is a fraction of the number that were originally produced. At present, there are 107 extant examples. Now that I've introduced the salient features of the pilgrimage mandala genre, I'll devote the remaining time to a close comparative analysis of two versions of the Fuji pilgrimage mandala. Combining a reading of the institutional history of the area with a visual analysis of the paintings shows that the mandalas, which appear to be based on the same model, are in fact highly charged images that illustrate the interests and positions of two rival institutions located at the southern base of Mount Fuji. In producing orally transmitted visual narratives intended to shape the perception of viewers, these institutions turned mandalas into agents in themselves. In this sense, pilgrimage mandalas should be viewed as works that sought to intervene in history. The Fuji pilgrimage mandalas now housed in Fuji Hongu Sengen Shrine depict Fuji's iconic form towering over the landscape, viewed from the southern base of the mountain in Suruga province. I will refer to the paintings as the Hongu A and Hongu B versions. Both are essentially mountainscapes, defined by the image of a mountain, and both differ from the more standard pilgrimage mandalas that are defined by a shrine or temple complex. Both paintings also employ a similar compositional device in which the pilgrim viewer begins their journey from the bottom of the painting and climbs vertically up to Fuji's peak. The foreground describes the outer secular realm. Asama Shrine and Murayama Temple are illustrated in the middle ground, and the upper area captures the numinous space of Mount Fuji. Although both versions illustrate Asama Shrine and Murayama Temple, the relative priorities and emphases of each painting betray specific points of view and particular institutional interests. Before we begin a close analysis of the paintings, I will briefly outline the history of these two rival institutions that feature prominently in the story of the Fuji pilgrimage mandalas. Murayama Temple was a Buddhist institution established in the 12th century. It was dedicated to a form of mountain worship that involves secluding oneself in the mountains to undergo numerous physical trials in order to acquire spiritual powers. The Murayama monks identified Fuji's peaks as the location of Buddhist paradises, and they made a business of climbing Fuji to access these paradises, leading expeditions of male pilgrims to the summit to perform rituals and austerities. Until the early 17th century, Murayama controlled the area from Fuji's eighth station to its peak and almost all climbing related activities and profits. Along this route to Fuji's peak, the Murayama monks established a number of halls and rest stops for pilgrims to use for a fee. The temple also provided lodging for pilgrims um, on its grounds and around the base of the mountain, also for a fee. Though there were five entrances to climb Fuji, in the mid-16th century, the local feudal lord of Suruga province, Imagawa Yoshimoto, a strong supporter of Murayama Temple, instituted a policy in which those traveling from Western Japan were permitted to use only the Murayama entrance. In 1557, he also issued an official statement declaring himself the protector of Murayama and its pilgrims. Murayama's monastic community skillfully combined religious tenets with political savvy and an entrepreneurial spirit and the temple flourished, thanks in large part to Yoshimoto's support. Asama Shrine uh, was located just south of Murayama Temple in the town of Omiya. The shrine was established in the 9th century and was dedicated to pacifying Fuji's temperamental deity, Asama Okami, after a series of violent and destructive volcanic eruptions occurred in quick succession. The shrine was built around a spring called the Wakutama Ike, whose waters were said to derive from the melted snow from Fuji's peak. 
This was also the place where the volcano's lava had stopped flowing after one of its most devastating eruptions in the year 800. The Asama faith practiced at the shrine was devoted exclusively to mollifying the violent manifestations of Fuji's deity in order to avoid another calamitous eruption. Fuji was the object of worship and was not climbed by Asama's priests. In the early 16th century, Asama's priests established their own inns for visiting pilgrims in the town of Omiya. These were in direct competition with the inns run by Murayama's affiliates. Over the course of the 16th century, Asama's inns grew larger and stronger, expanding to neighboring provinces. The spread of Asama's inns was the result of larger social and economic changes that occurred in the medieval period, which included the development of transportation, the circulation of money, an increase in high quality pilgrims lodges, and the growth of towns around religious sites. The town of Omiya and Asama Shrine profited from the rise in pilgrimage traffic, as did all of Suruga province. The only exception was Murayama Temple, whose inns suffered as a consequence of the success of Asama's inns. Murayama now had to share pilgrims and profits with Asama Shrine. To compound the issue, a roadside prohibition board issued in the late 16th century declared that pilgrims traveling from Western Japan must pass through Omiya in order to climb Fuji. Even though there was a route directly to Murayama, pilgrims were required to take this detour through Asama Shrine. By the time the prohibition board was issued, however, Murayama's decline had already begun. First, there was Imagawa Yoshimoto's defeat by Oda Nobunaga in 1560. Then, in 1569, the warlord Takeda Shingen seized control of Omiya Castle and the surrounding area and precipitated Murayama's decline by favoring Asama Shrine. In 1604, Tokugawa Ieyasu also chose to support Asama Shrine and uh, rebuilt the grounds on a grand scale, adding a second story to what had been a one-story main hall. Control of the area from Fuji's eighth station to its peak was transferred from Murayama Temple to Asama Shrine. The golden age of Murayama thus came to an end, and the sect eventually died out. So with this background in mind, let us return to the two Fuji pilgrimage mandalas. I will argue that close comparative analysis of the details of the two paintings will reveal differences in emphasis that point to their differing patronage and history. In the Hongu A Fuji pilgrimage mandala, Asama Shrine appears in the lower middle ground, its main hall situated to the left near the edge of the painting. Just above, in the center of the middle ground, is Murayama Temple. Murayama's halls continue up in a vertical line along the central axis of the painting to the base of Mount Fuji, and its pilgrims climb to Fuji's peak led by Murayama's monks. In reality, the route to Fuji's base via Murayama's halls was not so straight and direct, nor was the distance between its halls so great. This compositional strategy, however, effectively conveys the, po the power of the Murayama institution and its privileged access to the mountain. Elongating the distance between its halls emphasizes Murayama's role in keeping travelers safe and comfortable on their journey to Fuji's peak. Asama Shrine is given comparatively little space in the painting. Based on these observations alone, we may conclude that affiliates of Murayama commissioned this mandala, illustrating a landscape in which their temple is dominant, while their institutional rival, Asama Shrine, is given a minor supporting role. We find a very different institutional landscape represented in the Hongu B Fuji pilgrimage mandala. Here, Asama Shrine appears as the larger, more powerful institution, its sprawling complex illustrated in the middle ground while Murayama Temple is pushed up and out of sight, <laughs> represented only by the roofs of its halls. Judging by, from the enlarged depiction of Asama Shrine and the cursory representation of Murayama Temple, patronage for the Hongu B mandala almost certainly came from Asama Shrine. This theory is strengthened by the mandala's representation of Fuji. Unlike in the Hongu A mandala, there are no pilgrims climbing Fuji no Buddhas enshrined in its peaks, no sun or moon represented in the surrounding sky. Instead, Fuji itself is presented as a deity, ruling majestically over the landscape, its abstract gold form pristine and magnificent. This vision of Fuji corresponds with the form of faith practiced at Asama Shrine, where the mountain was believed to embody Asama's enshrined deity. Murayama practitioners, by contrast, 
believed Fuji's peak was the location of Buddhist paradises, and pilgrims were encouraged to climb to the mountain's peak and perform austerities there. The Hongu A Fuji pilgrimage mandala reflects this view of the mountain in the representation of a Buddha in each of Fuji's three peaks, and in the trail of pilgrims climbing towards them. We can thus conclude that the Hongu A mandala was commissioned by affiliates of Murayama Temple, while the Hongu B mandala was commissioned by affiliates of Asama Shrine. Further examination of the details allows us to narrow down a date of production for the mandalas. Impressed in the bottom right corner of the Hongu A mandala is the seal of Kano Motonobu, one of the leading artists of the first half of the 16th century. Much has been written about whether or not this is by Motonobu, his studio, or a later painter, with no final consensus. Judging from the exceptionally high quality of, painting, of the painting, the materials used, which includes what has been identified as 16th century silk and natural min mineral pigments, and the overall style of the painting, the Hongu A mandala was likely produced in the Kano painting studio in the 16th century, when Motonobu was active, and may therefore be attributed to Motonobu. Motonobu died in 1559, a year before the death of Imagawa Yoshimoto, so we may further conclude that the Hongu A mandala was painted while Murayama was still ascendant in the mid 16th century. In the Hongu B mandala, Asama's main hall is represented as a one story structure, an indication that it was probably painted before Tokugawa Ieyasu's 1604 reconstruction when the hall was rebuilt with two stories, as we see it represented in later mandalas. It is, of course, possible that the painter referred to an earlier representation of the main hall, but the style of painting and the type of silk used indicate that it most likely is a 16th century painting. Moreover, if the grounds had been rebuilt at this time, at the time the mandala was painted, why would the Asama patrons who commissioned it to promote their shrine have chosen to illustrate the hall in its less illustrious form? We may therefore conclude that both paintings date to the second half of the 16th century. A number of Asama's halls were destroyed after a series of invasions and upheavals in Suruga province in the mid 16th century. A document from 1576 with the seal of Takeda Shingen orders five of Asama's inns to spearhead the rebuilding of Asama's grounds. Though Takeda's letter does not specify how the inns should carry out his order, contemporary documents indicate that they raised money through fundraising collected from pilgrims to build or rebuild structures around the shrine and to pay for ritual services and annual ceremonies, and that they were given permission to do this first by Imagawa Yoshimoto and then by Takeda Shingen. The inns also kept detailed records of the donations they received from pilgrims. It is therefore likely that collecting donations from pilgrims for the rebuilding is implicit in Takeda's 1576 order. Asama's inns were successful and speedy in their endeavor, and Asama Shrine celebrated uh, a renewal of its grounds in 1578. As already noted, the Hongu B mandala appears to date to the latter half of the 16th century. I propose that it could have been commissioned by one of Asama's inns following Takeda's order to rebuild the shrine and used to aid in their fundraising for the 1578 renewal. The painting thus reflects the push to rebuild the shrine and the impending decline of Murayama. While we, don't, while we do not have a similar record of Murayama Temple's fundraising history, we do know that Murayama's inns were very powerful in the 16th century, and that, like Asama's inns, they contributed a great deal of their profits to the maintenance and rebuilding of Murayama's grounds. It is therefore likely that one or several of Murayama's inns commissioned the Hongu A mandala to encourage and increase donations and to spread Fuji faith while advertising the area and the benefits of climbing the mountain. Alternatively, it may have been a wealthy, well-connected patron such as Imagawa Yoshimoto with the means and access to the Kano painting studio, who commissioned the mandala for the temple to use in its fundraising activities. The remarkably good condition of the painting suggests that it has always been highly valued and treated with care. A great deal more research is necessary to fully understand the complex iconography and historical circumstances surrounding the production of the Fuji pilgrimage mandalas. But this brief comparison illustrates how artists and patrons used pilgrimage mandalas to make visual arguments promoting specific institutional interests and posi positions while diminishing their competitors. I have conducted similar comparative analyses of pilgrimage mandala sites and have found that in each case, the patron institution has overlaid the mandala 
with its particular worldview and its specific aspirations to priority, a phenomenon not unique in the history of representation, but one still not fully addressed in the history of representing Japanese religious landscapes. Thus, pilgrimage mandalas not only call for pilgrimage and donations, they also encode the historical conditions of the time they were painted and contain visual narratives intended to shape the perception of viewers. Reading the artistic language of pilgrimage mandalas, beyond recognizing the creation of a novel artistic idiom designed for mass appeal, enlarges our understanding of a particular moment in Japan's social and religious history, making these images valuable primary sources that enhance and supplement research in a wide range of fields. Thank you. Um, because the, the government stabilized and um, started funding the shrines and temples again. So it was just during this period where there was you know, the insecurity economically. And do we know how much people gave typically? What was the typical offering? Um, that's a good question. There, I've looked at the, it, it's not much. I mean, it actually varies depending. There, there are these um, kanji sort of ledgers, that sh the fundraising ledgers that um, actually record the the names, the addresses, and the amounts received. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a totally selfish question, but um, considering that the Den Motonobu Hongu E Mandala mm -hmm. is what you call transitional work mm -hmm. from Mia Mandala, Shaji Mandala, to Sanki Mandala. Mm -hmm. And knowing that with Mia Mandela and Shaji Mandela, the inclusion of any architecture mm -hmm. gives it some meaning. So for a Kofuji uh, Kasaga Mandela, the presence of Kofuji means something mm -hmm. related to its commission, presumably. Uh -huh. Don't we need to account for the amount of real estate occupied by Seikenji in the lower portion of this painting? Huh. Well, that's a good question. It could be just that that was part of the iconography of Fuji that began with Chuan Kinko, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, it began much earlier than that. But right, but isn't that the earliest? They could have easily left it out or just done, just painted the Mino no Matsubara with some boats arriving and left out that part of the shore. And it's you never see that here, though. Right? I can't really tell what It's there. It's yeah, it's here. It's on the, on the left. Seikenji, so you have the Tokaido Road, mm -hmm. and then Seikenji is on the, is at the very left. You have the pointer. So that little two oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, please. Sorry. So this is the pagoda of Seikenji. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So it seems like part of like the how how one identifies Suruga, this particular base, and it just became the you know the, the three markers of of Fuji. So you have the the peak, Seikenji, and um, Nihono Matsubara. But that's something to look into. Why say Kenji? Yeah. Were reproductions made to sell to the pilgrims? No. Um, later, they were in the, like, the Meisho Zue genre. You see remnants of the compositions, and those were used kind of as guides or for virtual travel, um, but not big paintings like this. Which are the three Buddhist deities that are in the top of Mongolia? There, Well, that is a quest, still a question. Um, so it's, I was so they've been identified differently by different scholars. Okay. So the iconography isn't so clear. Um, it, they've been identified as Dainichi, Amida, and Yakushi. Those, that's what you see most, but there's some, some one scholar identifies, takes out Yakushi and puts Shaka, Shakyamuni in. Mm -hmm. So we're not, yeah, not totally certain. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, when they rebuilt the shrines, did they inscribe anything on any of the tiles so you identify? The year that they were built? The year was done, and then also when the tile was created in the reconstruction of the roof or any part of it? Yeah, yes. So uh, for example, Chomeji has, um, in the, the Hondo, one of the tiles, has the year, the year of its rebuilding in the 16th century. 
and I'm sure most of them probably have a date. So you have like the pagoda on a pagoda pillar or somewhere, the, the date of the reconstruction. Where are most of the um, Mangata Hills? I saw one of them was in the family, in the Nakajima family uh, yeah. collections. Uh, yeah, are they sort of dispersed all over, or are they held by some of the temples or some family compounds? Uh, mostly by the temples. So they're, where they're found in another reason why it's believed that they were used for fundraising is because they were found in the fundraising halls, the kokuya. And so more and more are being, they are found as these kokuya are being cleared out. But um, often they'll just be put in the collection of a museum, a nearby museum. Um, so the Fuji, these are actually not in the shrine temple collection, but in the nearby, um, in the Shizuoka Museum. Does that mean that they've sort of been overlooked by uh, collect Western collectors? Uh, yes. Kurt Gitter has a Nachi shrine pilgrimage mandala, and Vassar has a Nachi shrine pilgrimage mandala. Now the Met has the Chomeji pilgrimage mandala. And the Powers collection has the, an Issei Sanke mandala. But that's it in the, in the Western museums outside of Japan. In the Harvard. Oh, Harper. Yeah. Is that, is that, yeah. It's, I still, yes. So, and then that Harvard has the, that pair of Koya mandalas. Okay, well, thank you thank very, you. very much. Thank you.